<clears throat> keep in prayer a couple of people. Of course, remember the Warren family and love Brother Scott and Cheryl. And uh, sure uh, hated to hear the news this week. And so uh, we're praying for you, brother, and, and uh, for your family and so and your mom and uh, sweet, sweet lady. So anyways, keep them in your prayers, if you would, please. Uh, be in prayer, too, for others uh, like i said my wife's struggling she's doing better she thankfully but uh, down with this junk and so uh just keep keep the whole family in your prayers if you would not keep it from going throughout the whole bunch uh pray for vbs coming up this week we've got a busy busy week and it's going to be a good week we're looking forward to it pray that someone gets saved uh, a lot of work has gone into this and we we really want to see someone give their life to know Jesus as our Savior. Uh, tonight, in fact, there won't be any service here. We're going to be meeting out at Bob Henry. If you'd like to come out and join us at 6 o'clock. The reason for that is we want to canvas the area, get out there, meet folks, uh, invite them to VBS and uh, go door to door and just do some different things like that to be prepared. However, VBS will be starting tomorrow, 7 to 8.30. And if you know some kiddos and or you've got some grandkids or kids or nieces or nephews that would like to come or next door neighbors, uh, we've got cards. You'd be more than happy to give them, and they can register online if they would like or register there uh, at the uh, table when they get there. Uh, no Wednesday night service this uh, this Wednesday because we'll be we'll be doing VBS, and so be aware of that. Taekwondo also canceled July 28th. August 6th, men's breakfast, 9 a.m. Be aware of that if you would. Anything in particular, Brother Robbie, on that? Okay, gotcha. August 6th, also ladies' fellowship, 5.30 p.m. That is, I'm assuming, as long as uh, uh, Karen and Mike don't get stuck in customs coming back from Ireland. <laughs> Anyways, I think they're having a good time. Sending us pictures. They're sending us pictures of the Irish or the Ireland or Irish countryside there. Beautiful. It's beautiful. And, and I sent them a picture back of just dry grass. <laughs> I wanted to, though. I wanted to. <clears throat> Here you go. Yeah, it's all green over there, right? It's hard not to be when it's 60 and 70 and constantly raining. Uh, but anyways, uh, God bless them. We're glad that they're able to have some time with their family. Uh, August uh, August 6th, Ladies Fellowship, 530. August 8th, uh, Taekwondo Belt Certification Ceremony, 630. They're also going to have sign up for fall. Uh, if you'd like to be involved in that, they'd love to have you. August 13th, youth are going to go over to New Life Ranch and do a, a swim and a BBQ from 1 to 4 o'clock. And uh, New Life Ranch was really gracious to to work with us on that, and so we appreciate that. They've got some neat equipment over there. Uh, August 20th, Senior Saints meeting, 11 p.m., and then the 24th Women's Conference at Calvary Baptist. Be uh, aware of that. Be praying for that. Make plans to come if you can, ladies. Uh, I know you'll be blessed. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything I forgot. I want to thank everybody that was able to bring food for, for the Scots, uh, uh, the, uh, his dad's funeral the service and the dinner afterwards. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. Gotcha. Uh, who, who do I need to? Who? Robin. Robin, okay. I'll have Rob, Miss Robin. Great, good, amen. We can always squeeze an ice cream social in. No problem there at all. Anyways, Genesis 13. I hope you've had a good week this week. I know the campers did. I thank you for praying for them. Didn't have a huge group going, but that's all right. You know, God knows um, who needs to be there at that particular time. But they had a great time and uh, wonderful opportunities. Had one young man surrender to full-time ministry. Had a lot get saved. I'm talking about in the camp in general. And so it's just a really, really good time uh, that they had together. So uh, thank you for your prayers for them. They certainly need it, always need it. I'm going to talk to you today uh, about an interesting subject. I think it's one that often goes unspoken of, especially in our day and our time when, honestly, we want to hear positive things, and I got it. Uh, and, and the truth being told, uh, Christianity is positive. Uh, it has to do with the negative to repent of, but the positive portion of it is, the positive side of it is that we have a Savior who died for us to redeem us and that we can rest in His grace finding forgiveness in him. And so let's start uh, Genesis 13, 10 through 13, if you would. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. They separated themselves, the one from the other, Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Let's pray, shall we? 
Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us. Thank you for those that are able to be here with us, be with those that can't be, those, Lord, struggling, those uh, mourning. Father, comfort them, strengthen them. Be with our country now, Lord, as we desperately, desperately need you to work in the hearts and lives of Christians. God, draw us closer to you. Pray, Father, that you would uh, minister today. Lord, let this message be received in love and the spirit it's given. Let it be applied to our hearts and our lives. Help us to uh, very much uh, keep open mind and open heart to what is going to be said here. Let it be your words and not mine. We're going to thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Slippery Slope of Sin, the title of the message this morning. Uh, story goes that President Ronald Reagan years ago when he was just a little guy, and, and that was quite a long time back, uh, once told the story that when he was a teenager, he needed a new pair of boots made. In those days, you didn't just go to a shoe store and pick out X number of shoes there that you wanted or from X number of shoes. You went to the shop or shoemaker shop, right? And the, so the cobbler asked the young man, he said, sir, do you want blunt-ended toes on these boots or do you want pointed-ended toes on your boots? Mr. Reagan shrugged his shoulders and said, I, I really don't care, whatever you think. When the shoes were ready, Reagan examined his new boots and looked at the toes. One of them was flat, the other boot was pointed. Uh, Reagan said, how can I wear a pair of boots like this? He said, one of them's flat, one of them's pointed. How in the world? The cobbler said, well, you said you didn't care, and so I just took you at your word. Uh, anyways, from that day on, Ronald Reagan said, if you don't make a decision about the things that matter the most to you, someone else is going to come along and make it for you. That's truth. That's truth, folks. Very true. How important are the decisions that we make in our life? Uh, do we stop and think about them, really? Do we give them much merit? Uh, especially when it's made in the heat of passion or the moment there uh, when we're upset or something along those lines. Uh, every one of us in here this morning will have choices to make today. Every one of us. You made a choice by being here this morning. You made a choice in what you were going to wear. And you, very lovely crowd we have today, by the way, I say that. Uh, but you made a choice in being here. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to church this morning. And so that's a wonderful thing. Uh, certainly, some of you are going to agonize over what to eat for lunch. I don't know about you, but in our house we have a rule. Please don't ask what's for dinner. Please don't ask what's for lunch. It'll be there. It'll get there. Anybody else have that rule in your home? Ours is the only one? Thank you for that. I feel better now. Thank you. Anyways, uh, you're going to agonize over what to eat afterwards, right? You're going to think about those things. Some will wonder about their laundry that's piled up. Do you want to take care of it today or put it off till tomorrow? I've pulled apart a little portion of our deck because a lot of it's rotten. We've got a deck that's got more wood on it than Noah's Ark, uh, and a portion of it's rotten. We started tearing into this when this heat wave started. Uh, just because it needed to get done, and we had a few minutes, but boy, I tell you, we, we lasted about an hour, and that was it, and I haven't touched it since, and every Monday, on my day off, every Monday, I have that choice, that decision to make, am I going to mess with it today or not, and let me just say, God has made that choice very easy, no, <laughs> I may hit it in wintertime, when, when it gets to winter, maybe, you drive by my house, you can see it, anyways, uh, the truth being told, some of us are going to agonize over those types of things, still yet, Many of us are going to make the decision to obey the Lord or not in some area of our life. And might I say that, that that's a pretty big decision, right? That, that's a very serious decision, really. See, life is made up of our choices and our decisions, some of them good, some of them bad. What's unfortunate is that some people simply drift through life not really thinking about the decisions that they make, not thinking about how it's going to affect them, how it's going to affect others. Uh, in fact, a lot of times, my dad always would say uh, uh, that water will always travel the path of least resistance. That's true, right? Sometimes we make decisions based on that. Just follow the path of least resistance. Is that a good, is that a good standard to use in making choices in life? No. It, it's really not, my friends, because the path of least resistance, oftentimes, sad to say, uh, is, is the wrong path, really. Uh, and so we've got to keep that in, in mind. Uh, <clears throat> life is made up of all these choices gathered up, right? Um, what is unfortunate is that we too often don't think about where our decisions will lead us. Too often the only standard for making our decisions is to follow that path that provides us with the least resistance in life. So as we'll see this morning, Lot, Abraham's nephew, uh, was such a person. He, um, he didn't give it at least a very important junction in his life a lot of thought to the major decision that he was going to make. With just a few choices, bad choices, wrong choices, Lot's life would never be the same, folks. Uh, let me share with you this morning three 
three activities, three things, three truths, if you will, about the decisions that Lot made or about the one decision that he made and what followed from it uh, and what began his slide down this slippery slope of sin. Uh, back this winter, we actually got some uh, measurable snow on one of the occasions. And, and over the last couple of years, the times that we've got any amount of snow, I've always told the kids, hey, I want to go sledding. Let's go sledding, right? And for whatever reason, something will happen and I don't go uh, and I feel bad about it. Well, finally, this winter, I said, let's go sledding. And I said, okay, Dad, let's do it. And so we got a little spot uh, where a lot of people like to go over on Simmons Hill. You know where I'm talking about? Off Tahlequah Street. Is it Tahlequah? Anyways, you know what I'm talking about. It's over the Simmons Factory, Big Hill. Uh, anyways, and so it, it all started off good enough, well enough, right? Because uh, you kind of come in from the side, you get over there, and you don't have to worry about climbing the hill so much, at least the steep part. Uh, once you slide down, though, the way up, the kids had no problem with it. I didn't think I would have a problem with it. But every time I put a foot down into that snow, my foot would slide right out from under me and boop, there I go, right back down again. It was the most frustrating, most embarrassing thing I think I could honestly say that had happened to me in quite some time. Uh, I'm sure it won't be the most embarrassing thing that's happened to me uh, ever, but anyways. Uh, and, and so I got a reminder there of how easy it is to slide down slopes when you're not thinking about it, right? And sometimes, again, that's the way life is with these decisions that we make. Let's begin this morning by seeing three things. Number one, the choices that Lot made. Let's look at the choices that he made. In verse 10, chapter 13, if you have it there in your Bible, uh, I don't know if I've got that whole section there, Brother Robbie. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. And Lot lifted up his eyes. He beheld all the plain of Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere. Uh, boy, it just kind of seems a little tempting right there in and of itself, doesn't it? Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan. Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, it says, and sinners ex before the Lord exceedingly. Um, here's what happened. Uh, Lot's herd and Abraham's uncle Abraham's herd had gotten too too large for the land to really sustain them both, and the herdsmen were starting to kind of fight and, and butt heads and stuff like that. And so it came down to it. Abraham said, "Okay, look, here's what we're going to do, son. You take the right side, and I'll go left. Uh, you go left, and I'll go right. Just whichever, but we're going to have to separate to do this." And so Lot looked out. He saw this plain area right outside the area of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he said, "Hey, that looks great." That looks like a good place for cattle and things of that nature, and so that's what he chose, right? Uh, well, listen, folks, having kind of keeping that in the back of your mind for a second, did you ever stop to realize that choices that we make today are usually the ones that will define our lives tomorrow? I'm here today because of a choice that we made, and I'm thankful for it, very thankful for it, very grateful for it. Uh, but it's, it's very true. Uh, remember meeting my wife for the first time. Uh, a choice that she made, thankfully, and, and that I made, and I'm very grateful for that too. And so it's defined my life, who I've married, and, and uh, our kiddos, and all that stuff, right? Well, and so it's a positive thing, but it can also be on a negative side too that we don't think about. Backslidden lives, for instance, a term that we don't often hear about or hear anymore, but backslidden lives are simply the product of many wrong decisions, spiritually speaking has nothing to do with how you handle your money necessarily. Well, let me back up. I, let me be careful in saying that. You can, you can have a bank full of finances, a bank full of money, right, uh, and still be backslidden. So I want you to understand there's nothing uh, inherently connected with that, all right? Has has nothing to do with what kind of house you live in, what kind of clothes you wear. But spiritually speaking, you can make many wrong choices, spiritually speaking, that bring you to a point of living a backslidden life. At some point, we're each tempted with some type of sin. Maybe it's pride, maybe it's lust, maybe it's envy, envy and entertaining a wrong attitude that's not Christ-like. By the way, the Bible says what a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Whatsoever a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You get up in the morning and you just have this attitude that says, today is going to be a bad day. I rolled outside off on the wrong side of the bed and today is just going to be a tough day. I had a bit of a, 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 a little issue this morning when I got to church here. I have this routine we go through with the coffee pot because I'm going to tell you right now, it's somewhere written on the back of that coffee pot is, I do not like Brother Wes. I haven't found it yet, but I know it's there. Anyways, and I do everything I know to do to make that thing work right. 
Uh, and boy, it, it just didn't. It, it overflowed, it overfilled, and it went all over the counter, and I'm, I'm cleaning it all up, and I'm just, I just, you know, and I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, this could set your day, buddy. <laughs> if you let it, this could really set your day. Let's not let that happen, right? So you can wake up and have a bad attitude, and I promise you, it's gonna affect your day if you keep that attitude, right? Yeah, it, it just will, folks. And so our attitude's important in that, too. Regardless of whatever type of temptation that we face, we have choices to make. However, I find that oftentimes people have some misunderstanding concerning those decisions. Let me quickly share three mistakes that we, we personally can make. This is not getting into a lot yet, but we make. Number one, we can be tempted to think this. There is no way of knowing whether my choice is right or wrong. There just isn't. There's no way of knowing whether my personal choice here is right or wrong. I don't know if I have this verse, Brother Robbie. Is it Psalm 1911? Do we have that? Okay. 1911. Thank you, sir. Psalmist said, Thy word, if I hid in my heart, that I'm what? Might not sin against God. Where, where do we find out what's right and wrong? Church. God's word. Ultimately, right? We have, we have made the, the, the egregious error of, and we're going to get to the Bible here in a couple of weeks. We're going to start in 2 Peter chapter 1, and it says a lot about the authority of God's Word. But we have separated ourselves from the authority of God's Word, and that is a dangerous thing to do. God gives us His Word to protect us, to guide us, to direct us, folks. No wonder why we're struggling as Christians. No wonder why we, we need to pray for revival to take place in the land, because God's people have stopped being a Bible people. Living by the Word of God. Instead, it's what, what directs us is how I feel at that present moment, right? And even how I feel about that particular passage. Not what does the passage actually say, but what's my interpretation of it. Uh, that's dangerous. We're going to talk about that later on. But he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. So that is a, that's a misnomer to think that I cannot know uh, what is right or wrong. Look in God's word. Uh, and if you can't find, he says, thou shalt not do this or that, look for the principle, right? Look for the guiding principle that's there. Number two, second mistake. There is no real choice for him to make. My destiny's already written. My circumstances have determined this. How many times have we seen that played out in our culture today? My circumstances have dictated to me that I have to live like this. Mom and dad did this, so I have to do this because that's just the way I grew up. James 4, 7 it says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He doesn't give any kind of exemption to that or exception to that, folks. He says, resist the devil. He's talking to Christians. Folks, can I tell you, uh, our, I, I realize that God is sovereign, but we have been given by his grace, free will, to make the choices that we are able to make right? And we do. If you know Christ as your Savior, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. He enables you to make right choices. Don't convince yourself that I'm, I just can't do it. I've had family members tell me before and good friends tell me, you know, I've been this way so long. There's no chance for me to ever change now. That's just giving up. That's believing a lie of the devil, folks. Don't fall into that. Amen? Don't give up to that. Give in to that kind of thinking. Uh, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. And the third misnomer or misunderstanding that we bought into, unfortunately, is that there are no real consequences to my choices. I'll do what I want to do, and, and I'll never have to pay for it on the end. <laughs> you know, I found this. As many times as you go into these cell phone companies and stuff, and they say you can get a free phone, nothing's ever free in this life, right? <laughs> Nothing is ever free in this life. And, and without a doubt, I'll tell you this, and get a new phone. We re-up back here in uh, November, switched from one carrier to the next, and uh, working with my son and stuff, and all of us coming together as a family. And uh, they offered all kinds of great deals, right? They said, get a new phone, uh, and, and it's free. But by the way, we got to charge a tax on that. So that's $87, please, and thank you. <laughs> right? Uh, and so nothing is ever free free. Uh, you say, well, you're being a little silly, Pastor. I got it. But folks, listen, there's consequences to the decisions that we make. Some good consequences to good decisions that we make, but some bad too. But there's always consequences. We choose our sin. We don't get to choose the consequence. Right? We choose our decisions that we make in life. We don't get to choose the aftermath of it. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall a man also reap. That shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. 
he that soweth the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. That's the law of sowing and reaping. And it stands today. It will stand throughout time. Uh, I don't think we have this on the screen. That's okay. Or have it in my slides there, Brother Robbie. But Numbers 32, 23, if I don't, uh, let me read it for you. It says, but if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. Be sure your sin will find you out. You can think that you've escaped God's noticeable eye uh, or his all-seeing eye. But folks, listen, no, it's not possible. He sees all things. He said, well, he hasn't judged me yet. He hasn't brought the consequence yet. Listen, we have a patient, loving God, and I am so grateful. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the fact that he is patient. Amen? And here's what I have found. There are times that the consequences are held at bay for a little while because God's waiting on us to repent. Don't convince yourself, hey, I'll just slide under the radar. God won't notice. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> it doesn't work very well. Don't believe those lies, folks, those misunderstandings or however you want to call them. There are no real consequences to my choices. Yes, there are. Now, I say all of that to say Lot made three mistakes of his own. Number one, he chose sight over faith. Verse 10. He says in uh, Genesis 13, 10, you got it there in your Bible, Lot lifted up his eyes, right? He beheld all the plains, uh, a plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. He lifted up his eyes. He looked on it, right? He saw what was before him. He chose sight over faith. Um, he saw a land that was good for raising crops, great for cattle. But you know, he never asked himself a couple of important questions. And I find that we sometimes make this same mistake. I have at least. Is it a good place to live? A good place to raise a family? To serve the Lord? He only chose the land because it looked good. Now you say, pastors, does that always matter? I, I think it should. But especially in this case, because he knew Folks, you can't convince me that he did not know what was going on over there in Sodom and Gomorrah. The issue of homosexuality and the rampant immorality that was going on. The Bible says, and that's why I read that verse for you in verse 13, that God saw that what was going on and he said it's wicked. It's exceedingly wicked, right? But that didn't enter into uh, Lot's radar there. That he's taking a family over. We're, gonna get, we're not going in the city just yet, but we're going to get close over there because that's where the green grass is. He chose sight over faith. Apostle Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, guess what? We walk by faith, not by sight. Our sight will sometimes confuse us. It will misrepresent things. It may appear like this, but in reality it's not. I think of what the Bible tells us about the devil himself. He's an angel of what? Of light. Right? He appears to us as an angel of light. He even says, no wonder, his ministers People that follow him, right? People that are working for him appear as agents of light or angels of light as well. And, and so you, you can't always go by what you see, my friends. I have, I, I, I'm old enough uh, uh, to remember when uh, David Copperfield made the Statue of Liberty disappear. Anybody remember that trick? It, that was on ABC. It was on the three channels that were on at the time. <laughs> Right. If you, if you lived around here, lived in Oklahoma, where we were at there over in Tulsa, we had three channels growing up. So it was on probably on all three of them, actually. Uh, anyways, I remember him doing that, and I remember thinking, no way. That's not possible, right? My eyes saw one thing. I had a magician friend years later uh, that he was a Christian, and he would tell you, look, I, don't, I do illusions. I don't do ma magic. Uh, there's a difference. Uh, and so he said, what you saw on that, because I asked him about that. I've always wondered, how did he do that? that statue of Liberty is huge, right? How many, how many feet is it? What, 600, 500? It doesn't matter. It's big. You're not going to stuff it in the back seat of your car, right? Uh, and, and, and I said, how in the world do you make something like that disappear? He said, it's smoke and mirrors, man. It's smoke and mirrors. That's all it is. It's just sleight of hand. And he showed me a little trick. He did this little trick there, and he said, see there? What did your eyes see? And I said, well, I, you know, I saw that. And he said, no. He said, that's I'm, I said, I got you to see what you wanted to see. Don't always trust your sight, folks. It'll mislead you. Watch your sight over faith. Are you doing that today? Are we doing that today in our own life? Third, uh, second mistake, excuse me, that he made. He chose greed over contentment. He chose greed over contentment. Verse 10 says, he saw a land that was, or grass in an area, a plain that was well watered everywhere everywhere, right? So that's got to be mine. That's mine. The Bible says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. Be sure we'll take nothing out. Right? Boy, 
We desperately need to learn the art, the discipline of contentment. I need it. We all need it, right? Because we are taught, we are bombarded with messages that say, I need to have more. The newer iPhone, right? We're just talking about that. The newer this, the newer vehicle, the newer that, right? I need to have more, even to the detriment that we will put ourselves into thousands of dollars, sometimes for some individuals more than that, of dollars of debt. To say, I've got to have that rather than to be content. Here's a man who made a choice on saying, I want that because that looks better. I need that. You know, something else stands out to me about that situation. Who was the older of the two, obviously? Abram or Lot? Wouldn't it have been nice for him to have deferred and said, and I think this would have been even a cultural thing. I can't prove this, but it would have been nice for him to say, I don't know, Uncle Abraham. Where do you, where do you think? Where do you want first, right? To have deferred and have said that and to given the choice and the decision over to his uncle instead of saying, oh, wait, whoosh, I want that. <laughs> Glad you asked. Thank you. Yes, sir. May I have some more, please? Right? James 1, 14 through 15 tells us every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth, guess what? lust, I want, I desire over contentment and this is the end result. The third mistake he made is he chose worldliness over godliness. The Bible says again in Genesis chapter 13 verse 10 Lot lifted up his eyes, he beheld all the plain of Jordan it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zoar. Uh, that last part I want to kind of hone in on, even as the land of Egypt, you know, the Bible tells us one of the reasons why Lot chose where he chose was because it reminded him of Egypt. So when was he in Egypt? Glad you asked. <laughs> he was. Uh, in fact, in fact, chapter 13 begins with him coming out of Egypt. Remember, there was a famine in the land. Uncle Abram, in a, in a time, I believe, of a lack of faith and not believing God will take care of them where they were at, went and took his family down into Egypt. Interesting thought there because in Egypt, Abram never built an altar there. In fact, in Egypt, Abram dealt with a lot of issues. He had some problems. He had a lot of fear issues and some struggle with doubt and things of that nature. Well, you don't read much about Lot until he came up out of Egypt. And now Lot is choosing where he's going to live because he it reminds him of what? Guess what? Egypt. You say, what's wrong with Egypt? Well, Egypt oftentimes in Scripture is used to represent the world, folks. That's what it's used to represent. He, he looked at it. He saw all this nice stuff and all these things. And he said, that's what I got to have. I choose that over spirituality. I choose that over a close relationship with God. I choose that over godliness itself. Again, a dangerous reason and dangerous standard to use in making choices, folks. Someone once said, you can take the boy out of Egypt, but you cannot take Egypt out of the boy always. Lot chose the world over God. What does Scripture say about that? What does it tell us? Uh, James chapter 4, verse 4. We've read this here a few weeks ago. James says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship, that friendship of the world is enmity, to be at war with God, it's conflict with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's pretty serious, isn't it? I think we can get to that and agree on that. 1 John 2, 15 says, Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, verse 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 16. My friends, we've got to be careful about the choices we make. Second, we'll move on here, the course that he had to travel. So he made a choice, and with that choice and with that decision, it put him on a certain course of life, right? As often does. Genesis 13, 11 says, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. They separated themselves, <clears throat> the one from the other. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. By the way, I won't get into this and don't want to read into it too much here, but uh, there is something to be said that he separated himself from his older uncle, who, uh, quite honestly, wasn't a perfect man, but was a godly man. 
Abraham had made some mistakes, but he was a godly man. And so he separates himself from that kind of influence in doing what he has done. Uh, again, something that we really seriously need to think about in making our decisions. Uh, who am I allowing to feed into my life? Am I listening to people, that individuals that share my same uh, heart for the Word of God and for my Savior? Or am I listening to people that have no desire for that? Uh, because, listen, there's always someone out there that wants to tell us what to do, right? You don't have to look far. They're all around. <laughs> uh, we need to be careful who's pouring into our life, right? And so the course that he traveled, choices always do. They lead us down certain paths in life. Martin Lloyd-Jones, preacher from a long time ago, once said, the ultimate choice of any Christian life is always the choice between pleasing self and pleasing God. When it boils right down to it, the course that we choose there uh, is, do I want to please self and go down that road, or do I want to please God and go down that road over here? If making money is the priority in our life, we've placed ourselves on a specific course. Now, I understand it takes money to be able to pay the bills. We're learning that, right? <laughs> Things going up, we pray and we ask God to provide I understand that, but if it's the priority, the single one priority in your life, can I tell you, you put yourself on a course that can be very unfulfilling. Very unfulfilling, folks, if that's what you're living for. Um, you've chosen to find comfort or entertainment in alcohol, other controlling substances, then you're going to live a life uh, with the fact that, you, uh, that ultimately you're not only harming yourself, uh, but there's other things that come into it. Potentially someone else you could harm, uh, and you're sending a message to those who are watching you. Remember this, what we do in moderation, our children, our grandkids will always do in excess. What they see mom and dad doing, they will take and they will run with it. I promise you that. We choose to live an adulterous relationship outside of marriage. Then we'll reap the potential consequences of a destroyed family. If we choose not to take our relationship with the Lord very seriously, giving it the time that it deserves, then we're choosing to live a spiritually lukewarm and stagnant life, condemning ourselves to spiritual immaturity. However, and here's the good news, folks. You, you don't have to be perfect. God saved us. I got it. I know that. This isn't about perfection in that sense because no, none of us can live up to that. This is about living in the grace of God Almighty but having a heart for God. If you have a heart and desire to serve God, remember David was very imperfect. The New Testament, we learned that he was still a man after God's own heart. Why? Because when he realized he messed up, he confessed. He said, God, I don't want that for my life. I want this. I want you for my life. His heart's desire was to chase after God, not the things of the world. So please hear me when I say that, my friends, that we can, we can choose to say, look, God, I want to grow closer to you. I'm tired. I've seen what the world has to offer, and it's nothing. It's empty. Solomon said, I've had everything a person can have, but I'm going to tell you it's vanity. It's emptiness, right? Our course in this life is dependent upon the choices that we make. Lot made his decision when he lifted up his eyes to Sodom, now, unfortunately, he was on a course that would permanently impact his family. That being said, let me, let me show you how easy it is for him, and it was for him, to get on the wrong road. Again, number one, and this goes with what we saw in the last point, or the last, uh, yeah, main point here a second ago. He began with just one look, right? Just one look. And every time I say that, I hate to say, I hate to go down this road, but I always, that old song from the 60s or whatever, just one look, you guys, I don't even know who sang it, but it just comes back to mind, but just one look is all it took for him uh, to kind of get him off the uh, path that he needed to be on. Verse 10 says again, Genesis 13, he lifted up his eyes. When Lot lifted up his eyes, beheld all the plain of Jordan. Sin always begins by entertaining a look, a thought, right? Uh, and it goes from there. Lifted up his eyes to Sodom. He realized that it looked good. That's why the Bible tells us, by the way, it says to resist the devil, but it doesn't say to resist temptation. Let me explain. It says flee from it. Don't stand around and gawk at it, right? I can't keep birds from flying around over my head, but I can keep them from building a nest in my hair, right? That's true of all of us, right? So I can't help every billboard I, I see going down the road. No, you can't, and neither can I. But you can help that second glance. Keep your eyes focused where they need to be, right? A lot of times it's that one look that gets people soaked up into uh, pornography, right? I, I've got to go back and see more. Uh, unfortunately, one of the most powerful drugs in our society today is pornography. 
by the way. It's that one thought that we give way to in our mind that goes from there and we allow it to run wild. Uh, and folks, listen, we are called to flee from temptation. Don't sit around and mess around with it thinking we're strong enough, I can handle it. Just one look is all it took. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says this. I'll read it for you. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth without is, uh, is without the body, uh, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. Proverbs 6, 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Steer clear of the one look. Right? Or guard my... You know, Job said, I made a covenant with God that I would not let my eyes look upon a maid. He said, I'm not going to lust after a woman. I'm not going to do that. So ask God to guard your eyes. Guard your eye gate and your mind, right? He began with one look. Number two, he gave it some thought. Verse 12, Genesis 13, he gave it some thought. The Bible says, Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan. Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. It's interesting. He says it was in the direction of, right, in the area of. He was giving it some thought. He was mulling it over. The next step in the sin process is to do just that, right? Begins with the look, then it's up here. It's rolling around in our mind. It has not become a lifestyle yet, but it has gotten our attention. It's this stage of the process that we rationalize, that we begin to rationalize. Well, what would, what would be the harm of doing this? Other people do it, right? What would be the harm of being involved in this? Because there's others out there that are doing it, and they even call themselves Christians. What would be the harm? And so we start contemplating and thinking on it, giving some thought. Number three, he commits to it. Chapter 14, if you would, Genesis 14, 16. Jump over a page or so in your word. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 16, I, I left my... Thank you for having it. That's good. I'm glad I had it in there. Uh, I left my glasses back in my truck. Uh, and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. Let me explain what's happened. Sodom and the surrounding cities were taken captive by another king. Lot, his family, and his possessions were taken as well. Now, here's what Uncle Abram does because he cares about his, his nephew, right? And listen, folks, we have a heart for the Lord. If we have a heart that has been touched by the grace of God, we're not going to sit back with a pointed finger judging people who are living in the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah, so to speak. We're going to care enough about them to pray for them, amen, and to speak truth to them to show love to them and do what we can to help rescue them from that. And that's exactly what Abram does. He gets his servants together. They go in. They destroy the area, uh, destroy the bad guys, if you will. In fact, is uh, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to give some of their the, the loot to Abram. And you know what Abraham did? He said, no, I'm not going to take that. I'm sorry. The reason why he did it was because he knew the wickedness of those kings and of those cities. He wasn't going to go into that, into that way. He said, no, sorry. Not going to do it. Now, here's the interesting thing. You know what Lot does? I kind of see this as an opportunity here, folks. I kind of see this as God saying, Lot, hey, buddy, wake up. It's probably not a great place where you're dwelling. It's probably not a good place for your family. It's not a good place for you. But instead of taking the warning, Lot does this. He gathers up his goods, his wife, all the people. And he goes back in. In fact, I believe personally this is when he moves into the city from the plains, possibly because he thinks it's safer to live in the city. So now we have this commitment to this. All sense is abandoned, folks, when it comes to sin. And I, I believe truthfully with God's people, God speaks out starting, he starts speaking to us softly when we're involved in sin. And, and he's, he's quiet, he's that still small voice. Don't do that, Brother West. Come on, you know better than that. You've read your Bible. You know better than that. And I, I got my, I've got this. I'm doing this. I'm doing okay, Lord. I'm doing okay. And then he gets a little louder. Well, that's not, I told you, don't do that. <laughs> Here's what some of the consequences are going to be. I still got this, Lord, right? Until finally he's dropping a piano out of the third story window on top of me to get my attention, right? Anybody else know that pain sometimes? Folks, I, I don't want God to have to go through that. I'll tell you when it's my children, I don't want to have to go through that with my kids. Now, I told you to stop. This is the second time, right? Uh, don't make me make it a third time. Uh, listen, I think God does this oftentimes. I think this was a warning shot across his bow to say, look, 
Lot, I'm giving you an opportunity here, buddy. Don't go back into that place. There's nothing but trouble there. But he doesn't listen. He goes back. That's where we find our next point here. He allowed it to become part of his life. Chapter 19, if you would, verse 1. He allows it now to become a part of his life. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at evening. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them and bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Um, where did Lot sit? Where was he at? The Bible says he was in the gate of the city. It was a place of prominence, a place where often decisions were decided or things, great matters of law were, were judged. And so that was that's what that was, right? Folks, he has now committed himself to this place. All right, he's in the middle, in the midst of it. He's gone from pitching his tent outside of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now he's living inside the city. He's sitting in the gate. Uh, he is a part of the governance of the city. Slippery slope of sin starts out harmless enough and slow until it moves you in closer and it tangles you all up, gets you wrapped up. Lot had convinced himself through false reasoning that the city really wasn't that bad, maybe. Or maybe he thought that he could change it from the inside out, right? Instead of being concerned for where he was spiritually, where his children were spiritually. Thought, you know what? I can take care of this. Nonetheless, Sodom and Gomorrah would be judged. And folks, they weren't judged for their lack of hospitality. That has been something that's been said. They were judged for their evil, for their immorality, for their wickedness, for the homosexuality that was going on there. In fact, you just have to read chapter 19. We'll see some of it of what was going on and how, how deprived, depraved these individuals were in this situation. Uh, it, it, it really was a, a tragic situation. Then finally, let me be careful here. When I say this, in fact, I'm going to ch change this last point. If you don't mind, I'll leave that slide alone, uh, Brother Robbie. Don't show that last slide because I'm going to change it here. He developed a lingering for it. He lingered behind it. In fact, verse 15 and 16, chapter 19, read there. It says, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot. In other words, they tried to hurry him up and get him out of there. you got to get, man. Come on. It's time to go. Judgment's coming. Rise, take thy wife, thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold on upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful unto him, they brought him forth and set him without the city. Let me tell you this, and this is where I'm changing things up here. Um, it wasn't the sin of the city that Lot agreed with. We know that's not the, the truth because we read later on in, in 2 Peter and we'll see that, that it bothered him. It did bother him what was going on. It vexed his righteous soul, Peter says. So I got that. I really believe the lingering happened because he didn't want to leave the rest of his family behind. We'll see that here in a bit of what he lost. But he lingered nonetheless. Folks, whatever reason we have and what we commit ourselves to, and staying behind and saying, well, if I do this and my, my husband or my wife won't understand, if I make this decision for Jesus, my neighbor won't understand, and they'll think this of me. Or maybe they'll be offended because I've made this choice. You see, what we've done in, in our culture today in Christianity is we've said what other people think about us is more important than what our Heavenly Father says about us. I am not out to go out there and to... Have everybody think Brother West is just some mean, judgmental person. That is not what I'm about. If you know me well enough, you know that's the case. I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. I'm no, no better than anybody else. But when are we going to come to a point in our life, in our, in our faith, where we say the only thing that matters to me is what God thinks of me? Amen? When do we get to that point? To say, I'm going to live for the approval of my heavenly father and the applause of heaven over everything else. The choices he made, the course he traveled, and finally will be quick, the consequences he had to live with. Chapter 19, let's start again. Verse 1, we're going to read a few verses here. We won't read all of them. Verse 1, and there came two angels to Sodom at evening. Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. He bowed himself with his face toward the ground. He said, Behold, now, my lords, turn it, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, wash your feet. You shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, or no, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and he entered into his house. 
And he made them a feast, and he did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Hey, why did he want them to stay with them? Because he knew what would happen, or what would try to be take place, right? They weren't going to get anywhere with these guys. These were angels of God, right? Uh, they snapped their fingers, and it had been over. But Lot knew the situation, didn't he? He knew the wickedness of the city. Verse 4, but before the, 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 uh, they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and they said unto him, Where are the men which have come into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. It's a wicked term there. Lot went out at the door unto them, shut the door after him, and he said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters, this is amazing to me, which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye then to them as it is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. We'll stop there. The law of hospitality some have fallen on that would require a uh, lot or any host of a home uh, to do almost anything to protect their guest that's under their roof. And that is true. However, we never read or read that it's okay to offer up your daughters in that situation. It may be that he did so thinking, justifying in his mind that these are homosexuals are not going to want anything to do with them. Maybe he was being sarcastic. I don't believe so. I think he was just trying to find some way to work this awful situation out. Nonetheless, it shows you where this guy is at in his life. Saying, men, this is awful. Don't do this. Go back home. Go back home. You're not going to get anywhere here. Go back home. He doesn't do that. Verse, uh, verse 9, and they said, stand back, speaking of the, uh, of the men, uh, or excuse me, these men outside of the city. Stand back, and they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn with us, and he will needs be a judge. You see, you can try to hang out and mix in with the crowd, if you will, in the world, but if you're truly a follower of Jesus Christ, that will, that should always speak truth of you. And ultimately, the world will only take care of us in a sense or be friendly to us, that's a better way of saying it, when we're friendly to them, when we're agreeing, let me say, with their lifestyle. And he goes on to say, this fellow, he came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break down the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, verse 12, Hast thou there any here any besides the son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out, into this place, out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxed great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Lot went out, and he spake unto his son-in-law's, uh, which married his daughters, and they said, Get you up out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Wow. There's always a price to be paid, my friends. Always a price to be paid. Number one, Lot lost his devotion to God, I believe. You never once read about an altar being built in this city. Everywhere except for Egypt, where Uncle Abraham went, he built an altar. To remind him he belonged to God. To worship God there. You don't read that at Lot. Anywhere at least that I'm seeing. You may you say, Pastor, here it is. And you show it to me afterwards. But you don't see that. Lot's devotion to God was never quite the same after he lifted up his eyes unto Sodom. Second, he lost his standards. One right after the other, our friend lost his standards. He chose an area of wickedness to raise his family. He was made a prominent man in that town. He went to great extreme of offering his two daughters as bait to vile men. And he allows himself later on, you can read about it, to get drunk, commit incest with his daughters. One right after the other. One standard drops, one standard drops, then the next, then the next. Folks, listen, that's what happens when we get down this road, when we start traveling down it, right? Number three, and this is painful, he lost his testimony. When he goes to his sons-in-law, what do they, how do they respond? Come on, man. They, they, they thought of him as someone who mocked. Made a joke about your kid. Get out of here. Right? They couldn't believe him. Why? Because he lived in the city. He sat in the gate. He was a part of this. Not their sin, but, but he in a sense had been okay with things. I'm living here, right? It's okay with me. What goes on? Lost his testimony. It's a painful place to get to. 
And finally, folks, he lost his family. Probably the most painful thing there. Verse 17, chapter 19. He came to pass that when he had brought them forth abroad, talking about the angels, and said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou, and all the plain escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Jump down, if you would, to verse 24. The Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. He overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and which grew upon the land, or ground and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And Abram got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. He looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and behold, lo, the smoke of the country went up as smoke of a furnace. I don't believe she looked behind the wife because she missed the city, so to speak. I think she was simply showing the heartache that any mom would have to know she left children back there, right? Folks, listen, I, I don't pretend, and I've told you this, to be perfect. I know I've made decisions that have hurt myself, that have hurt my family in some degrees. I'm thankful for God's grace. I'm thankful for His mercy. Amen. I'm thankful for his patience. But we would be foolish to think, I can continue down this slippery slope thinking it's not going to matter. I'll keep making one decision right after the other, especially when God's whispering in our ears saying, turn from this. Don't keep going this way. Repent. Be forgiven. Walk in grace in the newness of life. Amen? Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Movie Alice in Wonderland or in the book, rather. Alice came to an icy fork in the road. Panic stung her as she stood frozen by 